Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Clinton Center. Oh my gosh, it's been too long. This is really our first big uh, public program that we've hosted uh, since the pandemic. And so, golly, so great to have such a great turnout tonight. And so I'm pleased to welcome you to our 33rd Compurist Distinguished Lecture Series, which is presented by the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton School of Public Service, and the Clinton Library. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. And please let, it, let me recognize my dear friend and my new partner, the Director of the Clinton Library, Dr. Jay Barth. We're so pleased to have Jay on our team. And Dr. Vicki Soto, the Dean of the Clinton School, is joining us virtually this evening. She had a longstanding family commitment. So, hi, Vicki. I know you're tuning in from somewhere. The Compurist Distinguished Lecture Series was established with a generous gift from the Compurist family in honor of their parents, Dr. Frank Compuris and Kula Compuris. And we are truly, truly grateful for the outstanding, diverse programs we have been able to share with our community since the inaugural lecture with President Clinton in 2007. And I'm so pleased that we have Dr. Dean and uh, Mary Compuris with us this evening. And uh, is Frank with us? Frank, thank you for representing the Compuris family. And we also have, I believe, with us our city director, Kathy Webb. Kathy's here, yes. Is Vivian Flowers, I thought she might, uh, she's, uh, there's a chair with her name on it for her when she gets here. Please save her seat, perfect, thank you. And I'm also just very pleased to have with us the Bishop of the Diocese of Little Rock, Bishop Anthony Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Tonight, we are very pleased to commemorate Pride Month with a conversation featuring distinguished faith leaders from around our country. Our panelists are Reverend Frederick A. Davey, he is the Senior Strategic Advisor to the President at Union Theological Seminary, and he's also Senior Advisor for Racial Equity at Interfaith America and a Commissioner with the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Thank you so much for being with us. And virtually on the screen here, you can see Father James Martin, who is a Jesuit priest and editor-at-large of America Magazine, the Jesuit Review of Faith and Culture. He is also a con consultor to the Vatican's Diacristy for Communication, and he is the author of many best-selling books, and he has a film right now that is at Tribeca, is that right, the Tribeca Film Festival. Please join me in welcoming Father Martin. <laughs> By the way, I'm also his biggest follower on Twitter, in case you wanted to know. Paul Begala usually tweets first, and then I'm usually right behind him. So very happy to have Father Martin with us. And also, we're very excited that Sarah Wilkie is here. She's the Director of Global Relations for the Institute for Discipleship. She's built a national reputation in United Methodism as an innovator, serving in pivotal lay leadership roles in the denominations institutions. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome home. <laughs> and our wonderful moderator tonight is Frank Lockwood, who I know many of you know Frank. He's currently the religion editor of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and previously he served as the Washington, D.C. correspondent and political e uh, editor for the Washington Post. So, no. excuse me, what am I saying? For the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, I have Washington on my mind. Sorry, I need to obviously get my mind out of what's happening in Washington, D.C. So excuse me for that little slip there. He served as the Washington, D.C. correspondent for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Washington out of my mind. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So our panelists this evening will be discussing their perspectives on the intersection of human sexuality and the American church. Through this convening and many other of our programs here at the Clinton Presidential Center, we really try to honor and emulate President Clinton's steadfast belief that although our differences do matter, our common humanity matters much more. 
This is gonna be a really interesting program. I'm so pleased that you all are here. And Frank, let's get the show on the road. Well, wonderful. Thanks. I've been a reporter a while, and when I first started, things were very different for the gay and lesbian bisexual community. Try this again. Oh. Do I just need to speak louder? All right. Uh, I've been doing this for a while, and uh, when I started, the legal terrain was very different. Uh, intimate sexual relations between same-sex adults was a crime in a lot of places. Uh, you had to stay in the closet if you wanted to be in the military. Uh, denominations were very hostile. Things have changed a lot in the past 20 years. I wondered if you could share, uh, Sarah, the United Methodist Church, what kind of changes you've seen in your own denomination over your time in, in that church? Well, um, I just celebrated my 60th birthday. So 60 years ago, uh, a little congregation in Wichita, Kansas, uh, stood uh, with my parents and made baptismal vows to raise me up in the way that leads to life eternal. That's um, our baptismal vows in any, in any faith tradition are uh, important. And I think the change is um, um, we've gone through, and that actually, uh, the Methodist Church didn't really get a hold of starting to chew on this until like 72 is when it got really ugly. Um, and it became a, it, it just became, you know, our, our, the Methodist Church is so structured like our our government. I mean, it, it mimics so much of, of the United States. Um, and, and I think it makes a difference in how you, you have to think of that. You have to put it in that perspective because politics bleeds into the church every day. Uh, the minute we started putting, and I, hear me, I am honored to be at the, uh, here at a presidential library. I am honored um, to be um, a, a, a citizen of this country. But I also know that we have a lot of work to do. And when we put a flag at the front of the sanctuary, um, we have the Christian flag and then we have the United States flag and people get real confused about what they're thinking in the pew. I think that begins to deteriorate the church. So where is the Methodist church today? It's all over the news, it's all over the papers. Um, we're just having knocked down drag outs all over. Um, uh, we, we were, I was talking, <laughs> We were, we were talking in the in the back room, uh, or the green room, I guess, um, and you know we were talking about the fact that uh, the, the 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 arguments we're having as people of faith uh, that are so hurtful to so many and so hurtful to Christianity uh, are are what we're doing in the Methodist Church. So right now the Methodist Church isn't. People say it's splitting. It's not splitting. It's fracturing. It's just all of our, it's, it's all, it's just fracturing is the only word I have for it and um, splintering and, and it's heartbreaking because I truly, people have asked, why would I stay in a denomination that rejects me? Well, because those people in the pews, first of all, they're accountable for me. Sorry, but if you ever have been president of baptism and you made the vows, you made a, you made a covenant with God too, right? So, <laughs> Pay attention, people. You made a covenant, and God doesn't break them. People do. Uh, so that's where I think, for me, the Methodist Church, and I, you know, the politics of the Methodist Church, you can read a lot about it if you really want to, and there's a lot of Methodists here. God bless you. Um, and I, But I think where we are is we're going to have to, we, we've, we've tried to agree to disagree at the, at the expense of the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. So agree to guess, disagree means let's just leave it my way. And I think that's where the United Methodist Church is, is we've said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to let the politics of polarization of our country uh, continue to hold certain populations under the heel of those that have power. Sorry, that was a very long answer. I won't give any more that long, but you did yeah. kind of push my hot button issue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Fred, you're Presbyterian. What has been happening in the Presbyterian Church? Sure. So let me, uh, let me talk about it in a few ways. First, let me talk about my sort of personal experience in the Presbyterian Church growing up. 
Uh, I'm Generations Presbyterian on my mother's side. Um, I grew up in a little Presbyterian church in Belmont, North Carolina. Uh, it was the only black Presbyterian church in the town, but as Jody Welker can tell you, who's here, uh, and a former classmate from Union Seminary in Richmond, um, that area of North Carolina, which is near Charlotte, um, is rich in Presbyterianism. But my little church was the only black Presbyterian church in our town. And I can honestly say, growing up in that church, I never ever heard a sermon that condemned homosexuality, that even addressed it. Now, part of that had to do with the fact that in my little town, even in those days, there were out gay people. And in fact, there were people who were born male in the town, in, my, in our little village, the little black village of Belmont, that actually um, cross-dressed, as we called it then, and came to church like that um, in, um, in the dress that they chose to wear. And because that was Annie Mae's son and Helen's son and Miss Ruby's son, um, nobody said anything because those were the children of our community. So the family ties mattered more than anything else. Family ties mattered in that little church, yeah. yeah. Let me fast forward to um, leaving seminary, Yale Divinity School, coming to New York in 1982 and still wrestling with my own sexuality and, um, and eventually coming out there. But in the Presbytery of New York City, it was, it was different than the rest of the country because New York is such a, as we all know, it's Sodom on the Hudson, um, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> um, and so the Presbytery actually represented uh, just that. There was a gay and lesbian at, at that time uh, committee within the church. There were openly gay ministers in New York City, in the Presbytery of New York City. And I ended up in a church that had a gay minister. It was an integrated church um, with lots of uh, professional people who were gay, who, were, um, who had been couples for a very long time. So it opened up a whole new world for me as a Presbyterian. So my little church there, uh, lots of support in the Presbytery of New York City. The National Church um, had a struggle for a while. We got close and we got this thing called Amendment B, which basically said, no, we're not going to ordain uh, openly gay people. But in 2010, the Presbyterian Church USA uh, passed, um, I guess, what do we call it, Jody? Passed a, a change in the church law that allowed for the ordination of um, LGBTQ folks or LGBT folks, I think, LGB folks at the time. And we later brought the t got the T going. Um, I don't know what we do about the Q and the I and the A right now, but uh, <laughs> and the plus, but we at least got the L, G, G, and the B um, in, in 2010. And then the presbyteries ratified it in 2011. And now the church uh, supports the full and complete or nation of LGBTQ folks. And also a few years later, I think 2017, 2018, decided they would allow ministers or to uh, marry, uh, uh, to do uh, same-sex weddings as well. So um, individual experience really affirming, both at the local level and at the level of our adjudicatory, the presbytery. National church struggled with it, but they, have it right now. I mean, I could say more. I'm a preacher. I could talk all day. Yeah. I'll stop with that, and then I'll say more later. Well, Father Martin has just, you've just had a big conference in New York City, correct? Fordham University? Uh, we did. We had a, uh, it's called the Outreach LGBTQ Catholic Ministry Conference uh, in New York City, uh, brought together people who are in this ministry from around the world uh, just this weekend. Uh, and, you know, to your point, uh, that would have not that would not have happened ten years ago. Um, in the past couple of decades in the church, I would say that certainly in the fifties and sixties, it just wasn't talked about. Uh, it didn't need to be talked about. Everyone knew it was off limits. And in the seventies, after the Second Vatican Council, there was a certain opening up. Uh, there were groups like Dignity, which is a Catholic uh, organization that uh, a Catholic organization that ministers to Catholic LGBTQ people were. Uh, permitted in churches. Um, in the 80s and 90s, though, it really shut down. Places like Dignity were, were kicked out, and 
people were censured by the Vatican. Uh, it's really been with uh, the pontificate of Pope Francis uh, that things have opened up a lot more. Uh, pope Francis is the first pope ever to use the word gay publicly. Um, he's written warm letters of uh, encouragement to people who work with LGBTQ people. He has LGBTQ friends. He's, he's spoken about them openly. Um, he's talked about uh, Jesus would never say to a homosexual person, get away from me. So that's the first trend. But the second trend, I think, is actually much more long lasting, uh, which is that as more and more Catholics uh, come out uh, and are open about their sexual identity and their gender identity, uh, more and more families are affected. And as more and more families are affected, more and more parishes are affected and, and dioceses are affected, the Catholic schools. And, and so it's simply become part of people's lives. And so I always say that while the first trend uh, with Pope Francis could change tomorrow, we hope not. I mean, with the new Pope, things might change. I think that second trend, uh, certainly in the United States, in the West, and I'd say in general uh, around the world, that's not going to change. And so I see sort of more and more opening. One small thing that I think people tend to forget about um, in the Catholic Church, uh, you know, generally speaking, our teachers and our decision makers are, are our bishops and priests, and not obviously not exclusively, but in terms of the decision makers. And, you know, more and more bishops and priests now have uh, nieces and nephews who are out, right? And so that affects them. Uh, and so just, just by proximity, um, you know, it affects them and they, they see that the, um, the topic a little differently. So I think, but, but really in the last 10 years, there's been kind of a sea change uh, in the way that LGBTQ people uh, certainly are treated by the church. Well, and you have a letter you received in Spanish uh, not too long ago. Can you tell folks about that? Yeah, so uh, for our uh, conference, the one that was in person uh, this uh, weekend, this past weekend, uh, we had actually scheduled it in person last year, but it was uh, postponed because of COVID. So I wrote Pope Francis a letter saying, would you mind, uh, you know, either saying, doing a video or writing a letter to the conference. And he wrote a lovely letter to the conference uh, saying that God's style is closeness, compassion, and tenderness. Uh, and he said, I thought it was charming. It was in Spanish. I had to get it translated. Uh, I pray for your flock, you know, speak, referring to the LGBTQ community. Mm. And so there, you know, there's a situation that I, I don't, I just don't think would have happened 10 or 20 years ago where a Pope would be writing so warmly um, to a group like this. And I'd say, you know, I'm not the only one that receives letters like that. He has written to uh, uh, an Argentine sister who works with transgender people. Uh, he's worked with a written to a woman named Sister Janine Gramic who works with LGBTQ people. So this is, this is the way I think he prefers to do these things, which is um, in his own words, which is step by step you know, kind of slowly with gestures um, without upsetting the apple cart too much. Because we have to remember one quick thing, you know, what might seem lukewarm in the United States and, you know, sort of like big deal, uh, is a big deal overseas in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Eastern Europe. So, you know, in this universal church, you know, in the Catholic church, you know, what, what we might take for granted, other people might think of as a, a big challenge. Sarah, in the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterians, they dealt with this a long time ago. Why is it taking so long for the United Methodists to reach a decision on this? <laughs> uh, did I say I just turned 60? Um, well, first, let me just take a step back and say, my father's a retired bishop of the United Methodist Church. He's watching online. I'm, he's 92, and I'm grateful that he's present. He was the bishop of uh, Arkansas for 12 years and uh, was a great, it was just a great gift to our family to have the Arkansas family and to be a part of that. Um, and I say that because I want us to, um, I mean, I want you to understand why I'm even sitting here, I think, uh, and what role I'm playing in all of this. Um, I think the the Methodist Church, we, if, you, if my, my most jaded self, and I hate to bring my most jaded self to the party, but my most jaded self watched general, we, we meet quadrennially every four years. It's, if you're gonna do anything in Methodism, learn the word quadrennial. But every four years we make decisions and I watched 
general conference after general conference after general conference, I would watch these loving people who were struggling go into committee and try to find that, that way forward or even just, and, and sadly, as people who just want to love people, I watched, they'd say, well, could we, could we, have, could we agree to this? And they'd say, well, um, no, we can't agree to that. And so the, the poor progressive contingent would pull back a little bit. How about here? How about here? And then it literally in Fort Worth in, I don't know, it's been 10 or so years, 08, uh, I watched in Fort Worth dear friends who struggled, I mean, late into the night. You know how these church conferences go? It's like, it's like they don't think Jesus will show up till 2 a.m. or something. You know? <laughs> I, I don't understand it. And I watched these people just sacrifice so much of their, their health and well-being even and then darned if the, the folks that they had worked to negotiate with didn't walk to the podium and say, we're going to submit other leg uh, uh, minority legislation. And because we too are an international church um, and because we have a big country with a lot of perspectives, literally when we became, when we began embracing our global church more and more into our voting process, as progressive as the US became, we just couldn't, we couldn't hold the two parts together. And, and I think that's, um, for me, that's a huge piece of this. Well, and the Methodist Church has had essentially a don't ask, don't tell policy, correct? If yeah. you are a avowed, practicing, homosexual under church discipline, it's only if you're avowed and practicing. So, yeah, they played that game. I mean, yeah. we, we play that game. Um, you know, my wife of 32 years is sitting on the front row, and I'm so grateful that she's here with me tonight. But um, I, so most of my ministry as a, as a lay woman, I, uh, that was where it was tricky because I was a lay woman in some significant roles in our church. And it was like, oh, what do we do? What do we do with her? She hasn't, she hasn't asked to be an ordained elder of the church. So how do we, I'm a lay person. Um, I've never seen a church that said, ooh, uh, just a quick moment. When I ran one of our inner city missions in Dallas for 14 years, my boxing team, our boxing team, oh, wait, we Golden Glove champions? Can't, we were. <laughs> but uh, our boxing team was offered huge money from Budweiser. Friends, we didn't even have windows in our gymnasium in the summer because that was our air conditioning. We just didn't bother to replace them just to give you a sense of what money would have meant to our team. We turned down Budweiser money. And I say that to say, I, Nancy and I are tithers. I've, we've never had a church that did not take our check. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a real issue here with how included in the church we are and when we aren't. And the don't ask, don't tell is so vicious. It's so hurtful to so many. Um, uh, even even six years ago, I could not have sat here today because of the role I was in. Well, in, in the Catholic Church, there is still kind of a don't ask, don't tell policy for people that want to be involved in ministry, want to be in service. Uh, what does that do for members of the community that want to be faithful, Father Martin? Well, you know, I think it depends on where you happen to live. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, in the larger cities in New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, I mean, you know, large archdioceses, I think uh, dioceses and bishops and pastors are used to having LGBTQ people who are out as part of uh, parish councils and, you know, committees and things like that. In smaller places, it might not be uh, the same thing. Uh, it, it really depends. Uh, I, think, I think one of the difficulties for LGBTQ Catholics uh, in this country uh, is that so much of your uh, welcome in the church depends on where you happen to live, um, who your bishop happens to be, who your pastor happens to be. You know, obviously it depends on the culture of the of the locale. Uh, but unfortunately, that that sort of influences not only how the person feels uh, about the church, but how the person feels about God. Um, and so it, it varies. I would say it varies very dramatically. I live next door to a church, literally next door to a church. Uh, which has one of the largest LGBTQ outreach uh, programs in the country. It's run by the Paulist Fathers, which is a Catholic religious order. And that you can feel completely comfortable being an LGBTQ person. You can be a lector, you can 
come with your husband or your wife, you know, your same sex husband, same sex wife. That's not the case in every, in every church. And I get letters pretty much every day or, you know, uh, Facebook messages from people saying, I don't feel welcome at all uh, in my parish. You know, my, my priest has kind of singled me out sometimes by name, but usually said something, um, you know, uh, very negative or targeting about LGBTQ people or same sex marriage. So it depends where you are. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's a really unfortunate uh, dimension of the church today in terms of this uh, particular outreach. Fred, what does it do when a church tells somebody that's LGBTQ that uh, their lifestyle is sinful or uh, they're not uh, viewed as equal in the eyes of God? What kind of an impact does that have on individuals? Because that message has gone on, out an awful lot. Sure. No, it crushes the spirit. It dehumanizes people. It does just the opposite of what I think religion should be doing. And that's ennobling and uplifting and empowering and liberating, which is exactly what Jesus did when he walked this earth. And it's interesting that the Gospels have nothing to say on this issue. Read them front and back and over and however you want to do it. You're not going to find a single word, not a single condemnation. If anything, what you see is Jesus bringing people in. The woman at the well, right? Uh, she was a woman and she was, uh, she was a Samaritan. About as low as you can get in Jesus' day. And what did he do? I mean, he was a rabbi. They both could have been stoned and killed. And he talked to her. He engaged her. He brought her in. Church makes a grave, grave, grave error when it condemns people and crushes their spirit. That's not what God has called us to do. That's not love. That, that is not compassion. That is hate and hatefulness. It's a mistake. I, and actually, I think, I think people are scared. Right? I think people are scared of what they don't understand or don't want to try to understand. Sexuality is a powerful thing. Powerful. Some scientists say that's what all that's what all some of us live for. You know, we just we just sort of pretty it up. But that's basically, you know, sort of what these primal things are. For I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that it's a very powerful thing. It's a very precious gift. And not to allow people to give expression to that, I think, is not Christian. It is not Christ-like. Um, so um, if I have any message to anybody who's listening out there who hasn't, who's struggling with, you know, sort of how to minister around this, it is love people. Just love people. And give people the opportunity to be loved and to be in loving relationships. If we do that, then I think we will we'll go a long way of saving a lot of lives and giving a lot of people real opportunity. That was given me, um, and, uh, and that's a gift I'd like everyone to have. Father Martin, you have done ministry. You know people that I assume have been wounded by the church. Can you talk about uh, the importance of the church's uh, message to members of the community? Yeah, we're still struggling with that. We're still struggling with uh, how to reach out to this community. Um, I think many people have been wounded uh, by things that uh, you know church leaders have said of all stripes. You know, um, not just ordained church leaders. Um, I, I think that um, people don't really understand, you know, how stigmatizing the language is. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm told often uh, by people is, well, hate the sin, love the sinner. Now, there's no other group that is talked about like that. You know, I often point out to people that uh, in the Catholic Church, some 80% of married Catholics, straight married Catholics, uh, in the most recent poll, have said that they have no moral problem with contraception, which is against church teaching, okay? 
And no one says, if I'm going to give a talk to married couples, no one says, hate the sin, love the sinner. No one categorizes them like that. Or as another example, uh, college age students, college age Catholic students, I think something like 50 to 60% more before the pandemic uh, are or were sexually active. Okay, so it's a, it's a huge number of people in terms of percentages that are not following, not conforming their lives to church teaching. When I go to give a talk at a college campus, no one says, oh, hate the sin, love the sinner. It's only the LGBTQ person who is singled out and only for the sexual morality part. If I give a talk to businessmen who you know, may not be paying a fair wage or may not be uh, you know, sort of taking care of the environment or you know, doing unethical business practices, no one calls them sinners. It's the LGBTQ person who is consistently singled out only about their sexual morality. Uh, and again, I, I think that this is, you know, I, as was just said, unchristian. Uh, you know, another thing about the woman at the well I like to point out is that the woman at the well uh, was married five times and is living with a man who's not her husband. And so in addition, you know, as was just said, uh, in addition to uh, being a Samaritan and a woman, a third reason that Jesus by rights shouldn't have been talking to her or should have excluded her is because of her irregular, irregular sexual past and present, okay? And he doesn't. And yet, you know, in the church, we tend to single these people out uh, rather than reaching out to them and welcoming them. So I think, again, you know, you look at all these, you know, obviously, you know, Jesus confronts people in different ways, but, you know, in these situations where people are on the margins and really persecuted in some places, Jesus is always reaching out to them and bringing them into the center. Uh, and I think that really is something that, um, that the Catholic Church is trying to do. One of the, I'll, I'll leave you with one, one quote that I really like. Um, I was giving a talk uh, at, a co at, a, yeah, at a college um, a year or two ago, and uh, a young man came up to me and told me something that another Jesuit priest, I'm a Jesuit priest, uh, said to him, a young uh, gay man, and I thought it was very hopeful and also very honest. And the Jesuit priest said to him, God loves you and your church is learning to love you. And I thought that was honest and, and hopeful, um, but you know, also difficult to hear for people. So God loves you and your church is learning to love you, I think is, a, is, a, is an honest message to LGBTQ Catholics. Sarah, a lot of folks will point at the Bible and say, the Bible says it's wrong, the Bible says it's wrong. I'm sure you've heard that. What uh, the Methodist Church looks at scripture, but it looks at three other major factors as well, correct? Yes. What are those? I always you forget You want me one. to do the Wesley Quadrant? Please. <laughs> Good grief. Um, I'm, I'm looking for help. Uh, well, um, gosh, let me think about that. Uh, scripture, experience, uh, his, uh, reason. We've got some Methodists. Yeah, I've got that. I, my, my Methodists are here. Uh, uh, we were not fed these questions ahead. So uh, uh, scripture, experience, reason, and tradition. There you go. See, um, thank you. Bless you all. Um, so, you know, we are given, that, that's the interesting thing. And I, I love, uh, I love the comment about We've just singled out the LGBTQ AI plus, which, you know, it's sad that each of us, we have to get lumped into a giant acronym. Uh, we're just human beings on the planet trying to live our lives faithfully. But um, I think in the, in the, in the Methodist tradition, uh, first we begin with grace and we love to sling this do no harm language, but the truth is we build in a lot of harm. And, um, but, but, the, but, you know, our, our, if we want, it's funny how we use the quadrilateral when we want to. All of these things, it's all, power gives you the choice of when you want to use what, right? So if I'm the authority, let's see, today, um, I want people to think this out in this way, so I'm gonna use uh, reason and, and tradition, and, oh, 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 tradition, or, you know, scripture, and, and full disclosure, I'm very proud of the fact that my parents uh, wrote a Bible study called Disciple Bible Study that was wildly popular, is still being used all around the world in multiple languages. More than 3 million people have taken it. 
I just took it again recently. And friends, I actually was stunned that I knew as much scripture as I did. I have taken that. <laughs> I, I actually know scripture too. And so, but I do know that um, somewhere along the line, I learned that um, when it says, you know, we, we turn weapons into plowshares, well, that's the scripture. The scripture is not a weapon, it's a plowshare. We should be sowing the seeds of Christianity with the scripture, not using it to beat people up. Uh, and that's, that's what breaks my heart. I think it's what broke my, my mother's heart was to watch the scripture so viciously used. And I just wanted to, as we were talking earlier, I wanted to say something about the hurt of this. We always think about the hurt to the, the gay community. Friends, we have some thick skin. We take it on the chin all the time. But and my mother's passed now. But when my mother was living and my father had to go through the mail after general conferences and big events and weed out the hate mail that she would get for simply standing when the gay community would enter and plead through song. For well, this wasn't Fred standing. Phelps sending letters. This was not Fred was Phelps. Methodist. No, these are... No, oh, these are, and my mom used to say the hard part about having a gay child is you, you, you're, you have a bruise and everybody just elbows it without knowing it. Mm. And I, because I was working for the church, my, I couldn't really, my parents couldn't say, oh, I have a gay daughter, or I would be unemployed. So it was a tough call. And, and, and a lot of my uh, gay brothers and sisters in the church really didn't appreciate that. I've taken a little beating from both sides of this. So this is really scary for me to even be here today representing a, a, a faction of the church that I am a part of, but hasn't always appreciated that I wasn't the, a poster child 30 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a whole different conversation, but. You your know. mother, you mentioned, she prayed for you and she prayed for your partner. I remember seeing that. Could you tell that story? Um, well, my mother, uh, and I actually am carrying a prayer bead that she gave me right before she died, and I'm just so, it's, it's, it's a very moving uh, to even be in Little Rock uh, and to be here talking about my, my mother. It, my mother was a woman of deep faith, and she told all the four of us that she began praying for who we would uh, share our lives with before we were even born, sort of, Lord, grant me a child and, and be, be preparing a partner in life for them. And when I flew to Little Rock uh, from Dallas to tell my parents um, at the age of 27 that, oh, I had finally figured out my life, um, uh, my mother not only said to me, well, and, and my, my parents had taken had been kind of conservative here. My father had buried a lot of young men to AIDS. I mean, you kind of have to remember the context. And so it was hard on pastors. I, I get that. Uh, but two things that happened. My mother immediately um, said, well, if, we, if we're going to preach Jesus, we need to live Jesus. And that was it. That, that, the conversation was over. We were good. And um, as I went up to my room that night, I looked over and my father was kneeling beside his bed, working that out with the Lord, and it was done. It, when I got up the next day, my mother called Nancy uh, very early, uh, and she called and she said, Nancy, I just want you to know I love you and I hope you'll love me back. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of her prayer when, when she taught us children that she had prayed for our spouses. She said, Please, I will love whoever you bring home. Be careful, parents. If you say that, you have to leave. <laughs> I will be careful with who you bring home. I, mean, I will love whoever you bring home. But would you please bring someone who will love me back? And I, I, she did, and I did. And um, that's that to me is the faith journey we should all be on. It's about family, right? It's not just the woman at the well. It's the bleeding woman who grabbed the hem of, of Jesus' garment. And Jesus said, daughter, claiming her back into the family of faith, daughter. That's huge. That one word was a word of great uh, compassion and, and inclusion. And do we, do we reach out to our LGBTQ uh, children and, and adults? I mean, I'm 60, but please reach out to me. I'm a human being. I hurt too. Um, do we reach out and say, sister, sister, 
sit with me in the pew. Brother, you're safe here. This is, this is, this is a sacred space, and you are a sacred child of God. That's, that's, you asked me about my mama. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, as we hear these debates go on in various denominations, a lot of the times we hear, just wait, just wait, slower, slower. Gradualism, I think, is what mm. some people have called it. What do you think of that approach? Not much, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, so the pastor in me wants to be uh, understanding. Um, but tell a kid that, you know, who's really struggling uh, to come into their own. Uh, just wait and you can be a full and complete person. That's a hard message to hear. Um, I think that, um, I think that people should come to, and I, I'm gonna be careful here because I think we throw this around a lot, but the people who ask people to wait Generally, people who already have, um, as Ted Kennedy might say, you know, they're already around third. They're they're already around to third base when they're born, if not having been given a home run, but are in positions of privilege and power. And so, it's easy to encourage people to just wait, just be patient, let it be incremental. When you already have what you need in order to live your lives. So it is, um, it is oppressive, it's unfair, it's not charitable uh, to ask people to delay becoming fully who they are and to be able to fully exercise that. Um, as a black man, I could make the comparison to being considered three-fifths of a person at the start of this nation. Who wants that kind of status, right? So, um, no, I don't think much of it. I don't think it holds much water and much credence. Um, and I think the people who encourage that should do a level of self-examination. I don't want to be condemn condemnatory of folks who do that, but I'd encourage them to do a level of self-examination and say, what is it that gives me the right to ask somebody else to delay their full development? And what privilege and power am I exercising when I do that? We have a lot of Methodist churches around the country and in Arkansas thinking about these issues right now. And some of them would say to you, look, if we take this issue up, it's going to split us apart. We're not going to have enough people to keep the doors together, the doors open. Um, and, you know, this is an issue that's going to sink us as a, as a congregation. What would you say to those people? Uh, trust God. Just have faith and trust God. And it might not, it might split the church. It might split the congregation. But I would say trust God and do the right thing. Um, and do it in a spirit of love and caring and compassion, obviously. But trust God and do the right thing. Take the step out in faith. Uh, Presbyterians are losing members. Uh, because of this and because of our other fairly progressive, some would say liberal, some would say nutty, uh, positions <laughs> on certain things. Um, but um, that's what faith is about. You know, these institutions are, are human institutions and we could easily be, they could easily become idols at the expense of following the leading and the guidance of the spirit. And I think, well, I could, so I think we, uh, we idolize way too many things in this society, and maybe these denominations are potential idols as well. If we can find it within ourselves to go deep, to really go deep and act out of a sense of love for each other and for our neighbor, even when we disagree, I think we'd have a different result. I think the problem is our egos and a whole bunch of other stuff get in the way that we don't fully examine. And so it keeps us from taking those compassionate steps that we really should take in the midst of this difficulty. 
But for those people who say it might tear us apart, I simply say, have faith, trust God, pray a lot, live a life of love, and then be there to, uh, to minister um, on the other side of it. Amen. Father Martin, uh, church teachings, are they always static? I mean, have we seen church doctrines change in the Catholic Church over the years? I mean, people that say uh, yes. this is the law of the church, it can't ever change. What's the historical reality? Well, I mean, Pope Francis just wrote a, I guess it was in one of his apostolic exhortations where he talked about the church's doctrine developing. Now, the fundamentals don't change, right? Obviously, I mean, uh, Jesus Christ is fully human, fully divine, the resurrection, the Trinity. Though, I mean, those, those essentials uh, do not change. You know, the creed, the things that uh, Catholics stand up and say every Sunday. Uh, but there are plenty of things that have changed, you know, right from the very beginning. You know, we look at uh, the Acts of the Apostles where they're talking about whether or not to welcome Gentiles, you know, non-Jews into the fold. Um, and the church has changed its position. I think most recently, the, pro the probably the most recent example of that is the death penalty, um, which had moved from being permissible um, to uh, sort of frowned upon to finally impermissible uh, in the catechism. And so it does. It, it does develop and it does change. Um, and I think we need to be realistic about it and we need to uh, not fear it uh, because the Holy Spirit, you know, as Fred was saying, the Holy Spirit, you know, continues to guide us. And I think on the question of uh, sexuality, um, I think we are continually learning more and more about LGBTQ people. Um, I think probably the leading edge, uh, certainly in the Catholic Church, which is very contentious, very um, really bitterly disputed um, is the question of transgender people. And I think one of the things that we need to be um, humble about is the fact that, um, you know, scientists and psychologists and um, social scientists are still learning things about this experience. I'm not an expert. And so I think, you know, at times the church needs to be, you know, there's, there's the teaching church, right? The ecclesia docens, but there's also the listening church the Ecclesia Decens, right? There's the, there's the church that needs to listen as well. So I think, um, you know, before the great mystery um, of, of humanity, of human anthropology, the church really needs to continue to, to learn and to listen, um, and to listen especially to experience. Um, so yeah, so again, the death penalty is, is probably the most recent example of, of church teaching changing fairly significantly. Sarah, it seems like this is a topic that makes a lot of people very uncomfortable, particularly in church settings. What is it about, about human sexuality that just uh, makes people so uncomfortable very often in many situations? Um, wow, I'm so glad you keep starting with me. Uh, you know, let's face it, we live in a country that has such puritanic uh, roots and anybody's sexual, if we use the word sex, it wigs us all out. I don't wanna know anything about anybody else's personal stuff, but when you say, I don't know about, I don't wanna know about their personal life, well, what are you asking to not know about? And I think that's the big issue. Uh, we don't, I've never gone to lunch with someone and they've asked about sex life right? That, that just doesn't, it, that, it's not going to come up in your pew. It's not going to come up with your friends. It's not going to come up. But it's heartbreaking to have lived my whole career um, and to have so many times where people, either the wonderful folks in the church who tried to set me up because they didn't know I had a wife. Uh, well, that was always weird. Their poor youth director. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> awkward uh, but really to to exclude my humanity by saying things like oh your private life oh your private life should be private well does that mean you don't know that i have this amazing spouse who um is my partner in life who is in her own right a human being with great gifts and graces i mean is that what we do because that's what happens when we shut people down for their identity 
Um, have you try this is a little experiment for yourself. Try going for three days in a group of like so if we were all on a retreat for three days, and you're the guest and you come in. Try doing it for three days and dance the dance of never mentioning that you have a spouse, never mentioning that gosh the Wi-Fi isn't very good and I need to reach out to. I was gone 17 days on the road one time and could hardly get an internet connection. And it was so hard because I couldn't say to my host country, I really need to touch base with my wife. We have some important things going on and we need to touch base. That's what happens when you, when you want to focus on the bedroom, which we don't do in any, again, we're just singling out a population that we want to go to this space that's, none, it, that, that, that's not in the conversation. It's not in the conversation of life. But our spouses, our children, I, I don't, we don't have children, but I have a lot of friends who do. I have a niece and her, and her wife, they have uh, one beautiful two-year-old and another on the way. They should not have to hide those beautiful babies from the world. They're a gift from God. And so that's, that's my answer to that question is, let's get this into the humanity piece of how do we truly interact with one another? How do we truly engage the family of faith? Because, and it's not about Methodism or Presbyterian or Catholic or Jewish. I mean, it really isn't. It's about, hey, we're people of God. And this, when, when God brought a baby into the world, God put a big old star up in the sky and said, don't miss this. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we worship a God that thinks that for every child that's born? Hope so. You know, uh, Dr. King uh, used to say that the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I've, I've been thinking about that as I've been seeing some of the Supreme Court decisions that have been coming down in recent days. I just want to ask you, uh, do you see, I mean, is from your viewpoint, is victory inevitable for the causes you believe in, or is the future in doubt? Absolutely. Christ will come again. Uh, ah. <laughs> but um, I think it's the last gasp. I mean, no power can seize nothing, but by demand, it never did and it never will. And this is the last gasp of what I think is probably Christian nationalism, maybe white Christian nationalism, if you all forgive me. But I think some of that is, uh, is what's at work here. I realize Car Clarence Thomas is in the mix, so I can't totally call it my <laughs> Christian nationalism. Also, though, some people would say I could, in spite of the fact that he's in the mix, so because he's in the mix. But I'm getting way far afield. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, you know, I think it's uh, an effort of the, uh, of the frightened minority to try to again hold on to a way of living that was that that was idolized, and and it and it represents a very just the pulling along. Just take the pulling alone. It represents a very minority uh, percentage of the people in this nation. It's just not where the nation is on guns, on um, on, on reproductive justice, um, um, and what was the latest one? There was a third one recently. It's just, it's just not, so I think it's this attempt, I think people want to try to hold the line. We're no longer, and I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but the stats bear it out, we are no longer solely a Judeo-Christian nation. Now the good news about America, I think is, is that we are the world's first religiously diverse democracy. The world's first. And we ought to celebrate the hell out of that and, and proclaim it from the mountaintops, you know? Um, we can do this in America. I was just in Nigeria on the U.S. Uh, US uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom visit. I was a sole commissioner. Um, I was, I met with Muslim leaders and Christian leaders and humanist leaders and government, non-governmental folks. And I was asked 
not to bring up the issue of homosexuality. That maybe it would come up when I went to the uh, Human Rights Commission meeting of Nigeria, but I could not, I was just encouraged not to bring it up otherwise. We're sitting in the Clinton Library having a free and unfettered discussion. That is, a, that is a great thing. And the nation needs to celebrate that, celebrate women and the many contributions they've made to this country, the sacrifices that people make, instead of saying, we're going to tell you by law what you can do with your bodies. That is not who we are. Yes. Um, uh, Justice Thomas said in his concurring opinion that we're coming after consensual sex. We're coming after contraception, really? And we're coming after marriage equality. Um, Alito says that's not, not the case. I think we ought to believe Thomas. Um, but I think all of this is a gasp to try to create an America who, that ha, who's, who's, whose existence has come and gone. And we're already somewhere else. So let's be there. You know, let's celebrate the fact that we are here. God, this is a great place. It is a wonderful human experiment. Why in the hell would we throw it away? And I feel like that's what, that's what, we're, that's what we're on the verge of doing. We're on the verge of taking it all and just slamming it against the wall. Let's, let's encourage people to be the best that they can be, to make a contribution to this experiment, and let's give them the tools and freedom to do that. Um, so I think we're going to win. I think it, it won't be easy. It's, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to give birth, but I suspect we, <laughs> we, <laughs> that we are in the pains of entering into a new era. And those who stand, who believe, I don't think they do, but who perceive themselves to be in a position of losing the most or losing what they think is really important, are probably going to fight the hardest against it. But I think we'll get there. I'm, I'm hopeful. Father Martin, how big of a factor do you think fear is in this entire debate? I think it's the factor. Uh, you know, I think that one of my favorite lines from the New Testament is, uh, perfect love drives out fear such a beautiful sentiment and it's true. But I also think perfect fear drives out love. And I think that the fear that people have of uh, the LGBTQ person, the person who's different, the person who's seen as other, whether that's a person of a different color or a refugee or a migrant uh, or an LGBTQ person or someone who's poor, someone from a different social class. Uh, I think that that fear, the fear of the other um, really can drive out love and can really, uh, you know, cause people even to take arms against one another. Uh, one of the problems with, you know, working, you know, in a church where some people feel that, you know, it's, it's, it's their duty, it's their holy duty to be prophetic uh, and oppose LGBTQ people. And a lot of this is because of fear of the other. Um, but, you know, for Jesus, there's no, I always say there's no us and them. There's, there's just an us. And Jesus was about uh, creating an us. And I, I always like to point up one, to one of his most famous parables. Everybody knows the parable of the Good Samaritan. And of course, as we know, the Samaritans and the Jews, you know, were very much at odds. Uh, and so we often look at the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, from the point of view of the, the Samaritan. We should always be a Good Samaritan. So the Good Samaritan is the one who helped the beaten man by the side of the road. But what we often miss uh, is it from the perspective of the beaten man. Uh, his salvation depends on the one whom he considers to be other, whom he considers to be different, whom he considers to be less than. Uh, and so our salvation, I think, as a country and as a nation, really depends on how we see the other. And I think this is, the, for me, the hidden meaning 
um, of that parable. So, you know, again, there, there should be no us in them uh, in God's reign. Sarah, you've watched this debate for a very long time. Do you think that we're near the end of it in the United Methodist Church? And when will you know that, uh, when will you be satisfied that the Methodist Church is where you believe it needs to be? Well, uh, you know, I think that the Methodist Church will find its, everybody will find a tent and they'll get under that tent. And then let's face it, where two or more are gathered, we have to have God because there will be an argument. And, um, <laughs> and we will find, you know, I, the human condition is we will, we will resolve some issues and we will find new issues. We will find new people to hate. We didn't hate transgender children uh, until someone decided, oh, look, a new population. Well, the gays got marriage, so who can we go after next? Um, I'm sorry, it, it's true. Think about it, look at the history. And now we're gonna circle back and have backlash. Uh, frankly, uh, we had a black man for president and we're, and, you know, people wanted to beat us up for that. And, and now um, they're going after women. Uh, I, all of our all of our equalities, whatever that means. Um, I don't think I've ever sat in a room that was equal. I mean, really, there's always a pecking order. So the church will find tents. They will get in it. They will uh, they'll sing kumbaya for a while, uh, and they'll and then they'll find something as little as let's change the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And if they resolve that they will find another reason because we're human. And I, I, I say this, and I, you know, I'm a youngest child, so I, I do tend to crack jokes, but I say this to say, this is a painful journey, the human condition. That as humans, we, we walk a, you know, we need Jesus. I mean, at the end of the day, we need Jesus. And telling people that they don't fit with what Jesus needs is, it's killing Christianity in America, frankly. I mean, the more we keep deciding who's in and who's out, the church just keeps shrinking. And it's, it's you know, I, I'm watching it even in my own family, which is so tightly connected and has such tremendous sense of the power of Jesus Christ in our lives. <clears throat> and my dad doesn't let a day go by that he doesn't say Jesus is our north. Jesus is our north. And yet we, we go west, we go east, we go south, we go every which way saying, well, Jesus is my buddy. No, Jesus is my north. And we have to help the church in whichever tent it ends up. Because guess what? If you go into a tent in the United Methodist Church that's not going to receive the LGBTQ uh, plus community, just wait till someone has a child. And just as you said, are you going to love the child of this couple that's been singing in the choir for five years that you celebrated when they came in? Are you going to love their child in 10 years when he begins to claim uh, 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 his body as her body? Or when at 14 he or she is different. I mean, at what point do those baptismal, I'm going to circle back to my baptismal vows. Go read them if you've forgotten yours. But we have to embrace that child and hold on to that child and say, no, no, no. I don't get to write the rules of who Jesus includes in the church. I don't get to write those. I don't care if you are the widest, malest, highest ranking person in the room. You are not Jesus Christ, who was not a white male. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just here to, you know. Well, Father Martin, we, we've heard that the Methodist Church moves slowly. I can vouch for that. Uh, the Catholic Church, some would say, moves even more slowly. Do you, do you think we'll live to see full inclusion for gays and, and lesbians in the Catholic Church? Is this something that's obtainable in our lifetime? 
Well, I think it depends what you mean. And yes, I mean, we all joke that uh, the Catholic Church thinks in centuries, not in days. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would, I would say that, uh, not to be um, Jesuitical about this, uh, <laughs> but that they are included already, right? And I think uh, that the, I, I always remind LGBTQ people, uh, you know, as was just said, you know, your baptism is the inclusion. You are as much a part of the Catholic Church as the Pope, as your local bishop, as your pastor, as me, as anyone else, right? And so, you know, in a, in a spiritual level, they are included. Um, uh, I would just like to see as a step, uh, you know, we heard about places like Nigeria, and, you know, in, in some places in the Catholic Church, uh, particularly, well, I won't call out certain countries, but some of the bishops actually side with repressive laws against LGBTQ people. So they side with publicly criminalizing uh, homosexuality. You know, as you know, in 70 countries, you can be jailed for being gay. You can be executed for being gay in 10 countries currently. And I'm, in, I'm sad to say that in some of these countries, you know, the Catholic bishops side publicly with these laws. Um, so, you know, my goal, and I mean, the goal of many other people uh, in this ministry uh, is simply for the Catholic Church to begin to listen to these people, to listen to them, uh, not only in terms of their struggles and how they're persecuted, but their experiences of God, right? I mean, the Holy Spirit is at work in these people, right, in this community. And uh, so that, that's the first step. So in, in terms of inclusion, if we don't listen to them and ask questions, and be open to them, we can't even begin to think about inclusion. So that's that's where we are in the Catholic Church right now. We're listening to them. Um, and even that uh, is shocking to people um, in, in certain parts of the, of the church, unfortunately. So we're really at square one. Well, Father Martin, Reverend Davey, Sarah Wilkie, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. And this has just been it's been wonderful to hear your perspectives. It's been a real gift. Can I thank the Clinton Library, Presidential Center, Foundation, um, School of uh, Public Service for doing this, uh, and thank uh, Bridget uh, for reaching out uh, to uh, make it happen. This is special. Um, um, I, I chose to come when I was asked um, because it is so special. And I don't think we should take it for granted. You are doing a really great thing here. Um, and, and I appreciate it. And you're doing it in a, it's e it would be easy to do this in New York. I think it's another statement to do it in Little Rock and in Arkansas. So I want to thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Father Martin, Sarah Wilkie, and Reverend Davey for this insightful, truly insightful conversation about your faith traditions and uh, this and the questions that continue and will always continue to surround human sexuality. So thank you to the panelists so much. <clears throat> And thank you to Frank Lockwood for your thoughtful questions that created a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Frank, for being here. I'm so glad I finally got to meet you in person. None of this would be possible without the Computers family, our AT&T, our the three entities that have different but interlocking missions, the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton School of Public Service, and the Clinton Presidential Library. And as director of the library, we are thrilled to now be included as a part of this series that brings such value to the Little Rock community and virtually across the nation. Once again, thanks to our audience for spending time with us, whether you are here in Little Rock or virtually. And to stay updated on future events, sign up on the, for the Clinton Center's monthly briefing at clintonfoundation.org. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening and travel safely. <laughs>